Yeah, yeah, diction. I know, we'll get to it in a minute, but I need some help. Uh, which one is more formal? We got Elvis uh, with his blue suede shoes. We got uh, rubber, rubber duckies. Which one should I be going with if I'm trying to look formal? I'll let you ponder that while you listen to the theme song. <laughs> All right, kids, we are back with another episode about diction. A real quick reminder, diction is an author's particular and distinctive word choice. Uh, remember that writers write what they write on purpose, and uh, that's particularly true when it comes down to the words that they use. Not that every single word in a very long novel is poured over and considered, but before an author sits down to write the novel, the author has an idea of what kind of diction to use. And uh, remember, we're going to be thinking about diction both as a writer and as a reader, particularly a reader who will be performing an analysis of somebody else's writing. Uh, this is a series made by an English teacher. This is what we do. Um, so uh, today we're going to talk about the difference between formal and informal diction. Formal and informal is almost literally the most basic way to talk about an author's diction because it's one of the easiest things to see in an author's diction. How about we start with some definitions? Can we get a definition of, thank you. Informal diction is the colloquial quotidian and pedestrian language of every, <laughs> okay, all right, take that. I, I see what you did there. That, they gave me a definition to read of informal diction that was written in formal diction. They're funny. Can I get a real definition, please? Thank you. Informal diction is the simple, refers to the simple and familiar words that we use in situations where we are comfortable. So when you're hanging out with your friends, when you're hanging out with your family, when you're hanging out online, you are less concerned about being precise and absolutely correct then you are about having fun and reinforcing the bonds that bring you together in that comfortable situation. That's opposed to formal diction, which refers to the sophisticated and complex words we use in situations that require a heightened sense of precision and care with language. Now, the biggest difference between formal and informal diction comes in uh, whether the words you're using are short, and general and slangy, or if the words are long and specific and academic. Uh, you know, <laughs> the thing that they did to me uh, earlier in the episode, yes, thank you for putting up the screenshot of that where I look ridiculous, that's fun. fine with that. Um, it's funny because words like colloquial and quotidian and pedestrian, those are very long, precise, academic ways to say slangy or general or common. Um, so there was, there was, it was ironic. I, now back when I was your age, Mrs. Harding said, uh, it's the difference between the 25 cent word and the $5 word. Uh, it's a metaphor, obviously, but I think you know kind of what I'm talking about. It's, you know, the difference between the 99 cent chicken nuggets at McDonald's and the 49.99 hamburger at the expensive restaurant. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, it would be great if I could see some examples. You're in luck. Uh, I have uh, two videos queued up, one showing informal diction and one showing formal diction. Roll them. So I don't know about you, CBC, but the future rewards those who press on. With patient and firm determination, I'm going to press on for jobs. I'm going to press on for equality. I'm going to press on for the sake of our children. I'm going to press on for the sake of all those families who are struggling right now. I don't have time to feel sorry for myself. I don't have time to complain. I'm going to press on. I expect all of you to march with me and press on. Take off your bedroom slippers. Put on your marching shoes. Shake it off. Stop complaining. Stop grumbling. Stop crying. We are going to press on. We've got work to do. I receive this honor with deep gratitude and great humility. It's an award that speaks to our highest aspirations. 
But for all the cruelty and hardship of our world, we are not mere prisoners of fate. Our actions matter and can bend history in the direction of justice. I believe that we must develop alternatives to violence that are tough enough to actually change behavior. For if we want a lasting peace, then the words of the international community must mean something. Those regimes that break the rules must be held accountable. Sanctions must exact a real price. Intransigence must be met with increased pressure, and such pressure exists only when the world stands together as one. Okay, yeah, that was a bit of a cheap stunt there, having it be the same speaker in both videos, informal and formal. But I did that because I want you to understand as a writer that your diction, your choice of diction when you write is not governed solely by who you are. It's also important to consider the audience and to consider the context. I mean, the, uh, the, the necessary diction for a, uh, a short story in my English class is going to be very different than the necessary diction for uh, a research paper in a social studies class. I mean, even the, the, the diction in your short story is going to be different than the diction that you would use in an analysis essay in my class. I want you to be precisely tuned to the situation and make sure that your diction is appropriate for the occasion. So let's dig into these and talk about why they work. That informal speech was uh, Barack Obama addressing the 2011 Congressional Black Caucus fundraising dinner. By and large, the people in that room have his back. They support the same policy proposals that he does they um, are typically Democrats, so they're of the same political party that he is. And uh, I think also importantly, they are African-American, as is Obama. They have a common history and a shared understanding of what it means uh, to be black and speaking in a space with other African-Americans. I mean, we all know the cliche about the stereotypical black church and the stereotypical white church as a guy who grew up going to a very, 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 very white church. I can tell you nobody ever spoke at my church the way Barack Obama is speaking to the Congressional Black Caucus here. But let's put his words up on the screen and talk about some of the specific ones that show informality. We often see informality demonstrated in the way words get shortened. Obama does not say the clause, I am. He uses the contraction, I'm, repeatedly throughout this part of his speech. He uses the word gonna, he does not say going to. He drops his G's off of struggling, marching, complaining, grumbling, crying. He uses gonna again at the end with we're gonna press on. We've got work to do. Um, but you also see uh, some phrases that he throws in there that are a little bit cliche or a little bit familiar. He talks about uh, feeling sorry for himself. He talks about bedroom slippers. And he does use the cliche of marching shoes. I mean, one of the things that you try to do when you are formal is you want to come up with new and interesting ways to say the thing that you're trying to say. And you're not going to resort to the cliche. Now, I'm not saying that Barack Obama is any less a talented speaker because he goes to the cliche of marching shoes in that moment, but it does suggest that he has some familiarity with the audience and they will let him get away with a cliche. And I also want to point out that just because the diction is informal doesn't mean that Obama isn't using solid rhetorical techniques in his writing. You'll notice that there is an allusion to Dr. King in With Patience and Firm Determination. Now, to be fair, Obama had quoted that line from Dr. King just before the video clip picked up. But still, the fact that he works that reference back into his own words is a, an important part of the way Barack Obama was building an argument there. More than that, you see an afro with, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I don't have time, I don't have time. Uh, and there's parallelism throughout. So even though it's 
not a bow tie situation, it's really much more of a rubber ducky tie situation, Obama isn't letting his rhetorical strengths lapse. Now, uh, the other Obama speech, this is from December of 2009. It is his Nobel lecture. He has won the Nobel Peace Prize. He is standing in front of and speaking to the people who awarded it to him, but also many other dignitaries, uh, people, heads of state, uh, special guests, past winners. He's got an audience in that room that, even though they may like him, they gave him the award. He needs to impress them. But more than that, this was less than a year into Obama's presidency. You're all very young and you don't remember this, but there was a lot of criticism of the Nobel, Nobel Committee at the time that they had awarded it to him very prematurely. And in fact, in his speech, Obama talks about having only been on the world stage for a very short time. But it means that Obama has a second equally important audience, which is his critics at home in the United States. So as he's crafting this Nobel lecture, he not only needs to speak strongly and impressively to those literally in the room with him, he needs to speak strongly and impressively to those who have a tendency to disagree with him and critique him back at home. Using formal diction is a good way to accomplish that. Formal diction obviates criticism that Barack Obama might be uh, unworthy of the Nobel Peace Prize, or he might have risen too soon. He's not prepared. I mean, he doesn't even know how to talk in front of the Nobel Prize Committee, they could say. But let's look at the speech and talk about some of the words he's using here that do make it formal. Obama receives this honor with gratitude, with humility. He talks about it being part of our highest aspirations. All of those words are very, very, they're the $5 words. You could drop a one syllable word in there for all of those. Thanks, shucks. I hope, you know, those are one syllable words that mean gratitude and humility and uh, aspirations, but he doesn't do that. Again, he drops in an allusion to Dr. King with uh, our actions bending history in the direction of justice. And in the second half of this excerpt, I, I, I really, I love the word intransigence. Uh, okay, I, I teach high school. I know what it means when somebody is being stubborn. And that's what I say to students when they're refusing to listen to reason and when they're refusing to stop doing the things that they are not supposed to do. But Barack Obama is not addressing a random 15 year old. Barack Obama is literally on the world stage and he is talking with the full weight and force of the United States democracy and military behind him. He has to be careful when he's addressing world leaders who disagree with him and when he's doing it in full view of those who would criticize him. He can't be sloppy. He can't be speaking off the cuff. He can't just throw out threats and words when, whenever he wants to, whenever the mood strikes him, whenever his phone is nearby for him to tweet it. He has to think carefully to give the impression not only that he is smart enough and qualified enough to be in this position, but that he has given his own policy a tremendous amount of thought, that he's not going into this blind, that he's not going into this without a sense of right and wrong and what he should be doing. A word like intransigence carries all of that in its many syllable intransigence. I guess it's just four. But if he'd said, hey, dictator, you better watch it, we, I, you wouldn't know what to say. Like, Obama, you're speaking to the Nobel Prize Committee and you're pointing your finger at the dictators. How do you not recognize the context and the importance of what it is that you are doing? Now, all of this points to uh, exactly what you should be thinking about as a writer. Writers write what they write on purpose, which means you should write what you write on purpose, and you need to consider the audience. You need to consider the context. If your audience is your social studies teacher and the context is a research paper, there are certain expectations about the language you use. Don't use the contraction. Don't use words like gonna. Use instead the $5 words like intransigence or humility. On the other hand, when you're tapping out a mean YouTube comment, you can call somebody stubborn, but at the same time, 
maybe you want to make the point to the person that you think is of lesser intelligence to you that you know what you're talking about. So maybe even in the YouTube comment section, you could throw out an intransigence. But I bet when you're sitting around in the basement hanging out with your friends and you drop the word intransigence, they would look at you like you were crazy because that word would be completely out of context for the formality of the situation. Formality and informality of diction is also a great way to approach a text as a reader, particularly if you are being asked to analyze something. Because looking at a writer's diction can tell you the context and audience if you don't have that information. Now, a lot of times a teacher will give you, or if you're in uh, AP Language of Composition, which is the AP class that I teach, the AP prompt will give you a lot of context and some information about the writer and the audience. But if you don't know that, if you're looking at a passage blindly, you can look at the diction that a writer is using and begin to make some guesses about who the audience is. If there's a lot of informality, like the way Barack Obama was talking about bedroom slippers and using contractions and saying gonna, then you know that it's going to be an audience, it has to be an audience that he's familiar with. Otherwise, you know, he's just making a tremendous mistake and writers write what they write on purpose. So it is a mistake. It isn't a mistake. It's exactly what he wants to do in that situation. And when you see words like uh, humility and aspirations and intransigence, you can make assumptions about that audience that Obama is trying to impress them in some way. That this is not an audience that is automatically behind him, but an audience that he needs to persuade and to pull along with him. And that's about it for this episode on Dixon. I have two quick additional points. One of them is that formality and informality, it isn't a binary choice like a coin flip in your heads or your tails. It's more of a continuum, there's a spectrum. And uh, formality lies at one end and informality at the other end. And you can be more or less formal than other writers and in particular situations. So if, if it's hard to pick out whether a writer is being completely formal or completely informal, Think about why a writer might want to do that. And you should also be able to recognize when a writer goes beyond the formality of Barack Obama in front of the Nobel Committee or the informality of Barack Obama in front of the Congressional Flat Caucus. Um, those were not the extremes. There's more formal than that. There's less formal than that. Uh, so remember spectrum, not just binary choice. And the, and the other thing, I've said it before and I will say it again, don't say a writer uses Dixon. If I say uh, in the speech Barack Obama is using Dixon, even though I'm using my nerd voice, I don't sound very smart. You need an adjective. To say somebody is using Dixon is literally to say somebody is using words. Right? It's like saying somebody is breathing air. So, give me an adjective. Obama is using formal Dixon. Obama is using informal Dixon. Um, that's all I have to say about this one. I will see you for the next one. And he's in this room with people who are uh, black like he is. Yeah, that makes me sound racist.